Thank you for joining us at VC2, where we are real people meeting real needs with the reality of Christ. If you have a testimony or any questions, we'd love to hear from you. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter as VC2 Online. You can also find out more about us, notes from each message, and a way to give at live.vc2online.com. We'd also love for you to stay up to date with what's going on here at VC2 by downloading the VC2 app. You can find it wherever you get your apps from. Today, we're wrapping up our series at the movies. During the series, we've been looking at different life lessons in movies and how we can apply them to our lives. Today, we're proud to introduce Brenda Harper as she concludes our series with the movie Hidden Figures. Well, welcome to Sunday morning at the movies. And today we're going to be talking about hidden figures. How many saw hidden figures? Oh, quite a few. Almost everybody, praise God. I saw that movie twice. It was so good. And I was excited when um, Pastor uh, Melinda asked me to talk about it because there are a lot of nuggets in that movie that God um, really, you know, revealed to me. And Hidden Figures is a movie about the true story of three brilliant African-American women at NASA. I didn't know they had black women at NASA, and I didn't know they had women, period, at NASA. I thought it was all, all men there. Um, the women were Katherine Johnson, Dorothy Vaughn, and Mary Jackson. These women served as the brains behind one of the greatest operations in history, the launch of astronaut John Glenn into orbit. This was a stunning achievement that restored the nation's confidence and turned around the space race. Until that time, the Russians were ahead of America in the race to the moon. These black women were mathematical geniuses. Most of America had never heard their story until last year when the movie came out. They were truly hidden figures, amen? Yeah. At that time, they were called human computers even before computers were created as we know them today. These women performed mathematical calculations that helped NASA to plan the trajectories of spaceships. The genius that was in Catherine and the other women were in them even when they were children. When the movie opens up, it shows Catherine as a little girl at the blackboard, and she's astonishing the teachers, you know, solving math problems that even the teacher couldn't solve. And that just goes to show you that God puts the gifts and talents that are in us, they're in us when we come here, amen? He sends us to the planet with gifts, special gifts, traits that are unique to you. And a lot of us go all through life, and we never really find out what that is and function in it. But today, I hope you will ask God to show you what he's placed in you and what he wants you to do. At the appointed time, God used Catherine to help America to be the first country to place a man on the moon. How many know that when God wants to solve a problem in the earth, he uses a man or a woman to do it? He raises us up, so you have to be willing for God to use you. When I saw that movie, it brought to mind that in the Bible, there are actually many hidden figures. And the first hidden figure I thought of was Joseph. He was a hidden figure. God raised up Joseph to solve a famine problem and to preserve the lives of God's chosen people, Israel. Pastor Chad recently did a, a wonderful series on the life of Joseph. Joseph's family did not know who he was. God gave Joseph a clue about his destiny when Joseph dreamed twice as a teenager that his family would bow down to him. But little did Joseph know how long the journey or how tedious the process would be. He went from the pit into what his, which his brothers threw him to becoming a slave in Potiphar's house to being in prison after being falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. The Bible doesn't say exactly how long Joseph was in captivity in Potiphar's house and in the prison, but we do know in Genesis 41 and 1, two years passed between the time that Joseph uh, interpreted the baker and the wine taster's dreams and when he was caught up to interpret Pharaoh's two dreams. So Joseph was in captivity quite a long time. Joseph was 17 year, years old when he was sold into Egypt. And in Genesis 41 and 46, we learn that he was 30 years old when he was made governor over Egypt. So that meant he spent a total of 17 years in Potiphar's house and prison. That was a long time. Many times we don't know how long our trials and our tests and our tribulations will be. But we do know that we can trust our God. Amen. We can trust him in the middle of it all because God knows what he's doing. And everything that you go through, every trial you experience, every 
thing that you think is bad that happened to you. God will redeem it to use when he's ready for you to launch out and do the things he's called you to do. You are uniquely qualified to help somebody else who's gone through the same thing you've gone through. Amen. The Bible says that we can comfort those with the same comfort that we've been comforted. No, we, we need to know that according to Romans chapter 8, verse 28, all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. And God declares in Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, say of the Lord, plans for good and not for evil, plans for a future and a hope. Another version says it this way, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. How many knew that God was thinking about you? I want to tell you, beloved, that you are always on his mind. He loves you so much, and he thinks about you. When, he, when you wake up in the morning, he says, oh, that's good. Cheryl's up. I know she's going to really represent for me today. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. We can trust our God, beloved. He knows what he's doing. Truly, Father does know best. Amen. We just have to remember that when we go through our trials and our tests. He didn't promise us a rose garden. He didn't say everything would be easy. But he did say he would be with us, and he'll never leave us nor forsake us. Amen? He'll never leave us alone. When Joseph became overseer over all of Egypt, Israel sent his sons to Egypt to get food because there was a famine in the land. And when his brothers saw Joseph, they did not recognize him. They had thrown a a teenager into the pit, and now he was a full-grown man, amen? And with all of the makeup and the things that the Egyptians wore, they didn't know who he was. But when Joseph revealed his identity, the brothers became very afraid. How many know that sometimes when your identity is revealed, people will become uncomfortable around you? Maybe even the ones in your family, they'll become afraid of you or uncomfortable or uneasy. But no matter what people think, don't look at people, don't look at their faces, but just keep your eyes on Jesus. And whatever he's told you to do, you do that. Amen. Amen. We have to pray like in the book of Acts. They prayed for a spirit of of boldness, even though they were being persecuted, they were being tried, they were being locked up and stoned and put into prison. But when these things happen, what the Bible says, they rejoice that they were counted worthy to go through these trials and tests for the Lord. Amen. Amen. And so what did they do? They prayed that the Holy Spirit would give them even more boldness. And that's exactly what he did. He made them even bolder for the Lord. So we have to stand strong and ask God to give us boldness in this time and in this day. Joseph's brothers were afraid that Joseph would take revenge on them for all the evil that they had done to him. However, Joseph surprised them by saying in Genesis 45, verses 7 and 8, And God sent me before you to preserve you a remnant in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. In this single verse, Joseph described who he was all along. He was a father. He was a Lord or a leader. And he was a ruler. This was his true identity, even when he was a teenager dreaming dreams. Amen. But his identity was not revealed until the appointed time. God placed these gifts in Joseph so that he could become the deliverer who saved his family from certain death and extinction. God knew all along who Joseph was. And at the right time, it was revealed to Joseph and to everyone around him. Moses was a hidden figure. His mother, Jochebed, literally hid him the first three months of his life. After Pharaoh, who after another Pharaoh rose up who did not know Joseph, he made the evil decree that all Hebrew male babies were to be killed. Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 3 says, Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as a wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the riverbank. According to God's plan, whose plan? According to God's plan, not man's plan, but God's plan, Pharaoh's daughter pulled the basket out of the water and raised Moses as her own son. 
Look at that. Pharaoh, that same Pharaoh, had declared that all the Hebrew babies would be killed because, you know, you know, Satan tries to kill all the deliverers. You know, he knows when he knows that something is coming on the horizon, he knows he doesn't know everything. But if he has a sense that somebody who's going to change things for the kingdom of God is coming, he tries to destroy it before it happens. Amen. So the devil's plan was to kill Moses. But God's plan was to hide Moses in the house of the very person that wanted to kill him. Amen. So God hid him in the house, in Pharaoh's house. Praise God. And a lot of us, God, are hiding us until the time for us to be revealed. So Pharaoh's daughter raised Moses at her, as her own son. But not only that, Moses' sister Miriam was standing nearby. And she ran over to Pharaoh's daughter and asked if she wanted her to go and fetch one of the Hebrew women to come and to nurse Moses. And when Pharaoh's daughter replied, yes, Miriam went and got her own mother. So look at that. I mean, God's just adding blessing on blessing. Not only did he save Moses' life, but he allowed Jochebed to take her own baby home and to nurse him for at least two years before it was time for him to be weaned. Amen? Not only did he save Moses' life, but he allowed Moses' biological mother to have the pleasure of nursing and caring for her own son and to teach him who he was. That's why when Moses was um, growing up in Pharaoh's house, he still knew his true identity. He knew that he wasn't an Egyptian. He knew he was a Hebrew. That's why when the Egyptian man and the Hebrew man were fighting, Moses took the side of the Hebrew and killed the Egyptian. He knew who he was. Amen? Amen. He thought. He knew that he was a Jew, but neither his family nor him fully knew his true identity, that like Joseph, Moses was also a deliverer. They didn't know who he was. Joseph was used by God to lead the Israelites into Egypt, and Moses was used by God to lead the Israelites out. Amen? Amen. Even Moses' sister Miriam did not discern, fully discern his true identity because she was his big sister. She had been around a lot longer. She thought she knew more. She thought Moses should listen to her. My sister could probably attest to that. I'm the oldest, right? And I get upset when they don't listen to me and do what I tell them. (laughs) Something about the oldest child. Amen. But so Miriam thought Moses should listen to her. She became jealous and she murmured against Moses. She thought she was equal to him in authority. But God had to show her differently when he struck her with leprosy. God knows who he's called. God knows the anointing he's placed on them. And whether they look like who you think they should be or act like you who you think they should be, God knows who he has called for specific duties and specific functions in the, in the, ch- in the church of God. Amen? Amen? I remember somebody telling me when I was first preaching, and uh, I preached at this church, and I remember this young lady said, you're not called to preach. You don't act like a preacher. You don't look like a preacher. But she didn't know. She didn't call me. Amen? God called us. And so we don't need to try to copy anybody else. We don't need to try to fit in anybody's mold. We need to fill the shoes that God has called us to fill. Amen. And not worry about it. Leave the people to God and just do what he's called you to do. So God has struck her with leprosy and Moses had to even intercede for his own sister for God to heal her. And Moses and God had a special relationship. They had it going on. They knew each other just like that. They had simpatico. Amen. Psalm 103, 7 says, he made his ways known to Moses and to the children of Israel, he made his acts known. The children of Israel knew the things that God did. They saw and witnessed what he did and the miracles he performed. But only Moses knew God's MO. He knew him personally. He knew his modus operandi. Amen. And you can't judge yourself by somebody else. Don't compare yourself to anybody else, but just compare yourself to the Lord. Amen. And be fully who he has called you to be. Joseph and Moses were both hidden figures with great purposes who did mighty exploits for God. They were undercover deliverers until the time came for their identities to be revealed. I had the pleasure of experiencing Torrent for the first time this year. Um, I'd heard a lot about it and I was excited and looking forward to it. And I enjoyed every speaker was great. But the part that really impacted me was when Pastor Chad was up speaking that night, and he shared his vision for VC2, for this church. He said that not only will VC2 build a legacy center that will impact this area, but that God will bring a renaissance, a new birth to Tennell, Georgia. I tell you, I got so excited when I heard that thing. 
Oh, my goodness. I said, Lord, you have brought me to the right place. Hey, Pastor Chad said, downtown Tennell will, will be revitalized. And this place, VC2, this place and this people will be a regional apostolic center to train people to go to the nations. Did y'all realize that? Did you know who you were? That you were going to do that? Oh, my God. I got so excited. You need to be excited, too. And you need to pray and ask God to make you ready because we got work to do. Amen. Praise God. So in that sense, VC2 is also a hidden figure. People, as I did, drive by that sign, VC2, not knowing what it means. See the little White House, VC2? Well, you know, you don't know what it means. But I've come to realize that God has placed VC2 here in Tennell, Georgia, to bring a mighty move of God to this area and a revival to this area. He has chosen this church and this people, you, 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 and especially you, to bring a mighty blow to the evil demonic spirit of racism that is prevalent in this area. Amen. It's time for that spirit to be torn down. Amen. Hallelujah. And God has called you to this place for this time and that season. There is a, there is a very poignant scene in um, the movie Hidden uh, hidden figures that really impacted me more than anything else in the movie. And the, the, star, the star person, Katherine Johnson, who, when they found out that she was so brilliant in math and she could help solve a problem, the, the, main, um, the main people, which were men, they had, at NASA, they had it divided. They had a room where all the, the white men were in the room. Kevin Costner was their supervisor. And then they had a room where there was some white women who were also there at NASA. And then they had a room where all the black women were. They were and they were in a totally separate building, hidden in a way. But these people were geniuses. So um, the, the men, they came to a, a point where they couldn't figure it out. They couldn't, it was something that was a glitz in the problem solving that was preventing them from, um, you know, um, coming up with a good pathway to the moon. So they asked all over NASA, is there anybody here? Do we have anybody who has the mathematical capability to help us to solve this problem? And well, it fell, it was revealed that Catherine, one of the black women, was brilliant and that she could come and help them solve it. So when she came, they had to bring her from where she was, out of, being, out of hiding, bring her over into the place where the men were, and she started working with them. Well, little did the supervisor know that NASA was segregated, and in the building where they were, there were signs that said for coloreds only, or actually for white only in that building. So she, Catherine couldn't go into the bathroom that was in the main building because it was for whites only. So whenever she had to go to the bathroom, she had to go almost a mile away to the building she came from where they had the for colored only uh, bathrooms. So she would stay as long as she could, but maybe two or three times during the day, she would disappear and be gone for a while because she had to jog a mile away and jog a mile back. And in the movie, it had the rain pouring and she's running in the rain and getting soaked and coming back. You know, your heart just went out to her. And you know, they didn't know where she was. But finally, Kevin Costner got so upset. He said to her, what are you doing? He said, we've got this, this, this you know, pressing. We've got this um, great thing we've got to do. And you keep disappearing. Where are you going? So she just broke down and cried and just shared with him what was going on. That she didn't have a place she could go to the bathroom where they were. So she had to jog a mile away and go to the bathroom in, in the uh, place she came from. He, he was surprised. He didn't know. Because a lot of times when we're walking in our own world, we don't even think about what other people are going through. When we're functioning in our own circle, you know, in our own little community, our own little race, we don't think about what the other people might be feeling. We just make, we just make presumptions. You know, that's what prejudice is, just making prejudgments about a whole group of people without even knowing what's really going on. So when he found that out, he was upset about it. And he took a pickaxe. I just thought this was great. I was cheering. He took an axe, and he went over to the bathroom, and the sign that said, for whites only, he knocked that thing down in front of everybody. And he said, I don't know what's going on out there in the world, but here in NASA, we're one. There's no difference. We're one. We're all working together for this country. We're one. There will be no division here in NASA. And when he said that, it was like a prophetic word just, just hit me in my spirit. Because that's the way God feels about the church. He doesn't care what's going on in the world. But here in the body of Christ, we are to be one. One in the spirit. One in the Lord. One in our calling. One in our faith. One in what we're doing for God. Amen. One in love. We're 
need to let the love of God just flow through us that we don't see color. Jesus didn't see color. We, I just need to know, are you my brother or are you my sister? There's only one race, and that's the human race. Amen. And that is why the church is so impotent in many ways. I have a, a dear friend who was like a spiritual mother to me. And she asked me one day, why we don't see the miracles in the church? And we don't see, you know, the things that happen in Acts going on in the church now. You know, people come up to get healed and get prayed for. And they go back just the way they were. What is it? You know, is it not enough faith? Part of it is that we're, we're not united. That there's division among us. You know, there's a saying that united we stand and divided we fall. And it is so true. There has to be unity. Where there's unity, there's strength. But God is saying that now is the season for that spirit of racism to die. And for his people, everybody that names the name of Christ, to come together as one and to come together in unity. And to work the work of the Lord while it is day. Amen? Amen. Praise God. And God, the Lord says in him and his church, there is to be no division. There's to be no separation between the races. It doesn't matter if you're black or white or Hispanic or Asian, if you're educated or uneducated, if you're rich or poor. We are to be one in Jesus Christ. And we're not to look down on each other for whatever the differences are. Amen. Praise God. And, you know, the Lord had dealt with me about that years ago. Um, you know, I came from New York City, as Pastor Melinda had mentioned. And in New York, up north, there's a different kind of racism. It's like it's not just in the south. It's all over. And in New York has an, a particularly different kind. And you grow up there as a black person growing up in New York. You grow up kind of expecting the other race to, to treat you poorly. It's like you look for it. And you know what you're looking for, a lot of times you'll get. But it's just a mindset. You grow up hearing it. You grow up reading certain books. I grew up uh, reading a lot of books that had to do with, you know, blacks being mistreated, you know, a man child in the promised land and all these books um, down these mean streets. All I mean, I just enjoy reading those books. But little did I know that what you read, you're putting into your spirit. And because I put that into my spirit as a teenager coming up, that's the way I was thinking. That was my mindset. And little did I know, because I, if you'd asked me, was I prejudiced? I said, no, I'm not prejudiced. I can't be prejudiced. I'm black. But little did I know <laughs> that prejudice is just prejudging another group of people. So you might not think you're better than them, but you have certain thoughts. Oh, they're this way, so they act like that. You know, and you expect it. And that's what God does not want to see among his people. Us prejudging people. He wants us to take people as they come. You know, just, you know, people are different. Just each one that comes to you, you deal with them the way they show you who they are. You know, and you love them. And if they show you there's somebody you can't deal with, then you don't deal with them. But not because of their color, but it's because of who they are. Amen? So the Lord is grieved and he's tired of this spirit of racism. And he's tired of it having, having it in his church. And in Ephesians um, 2, oh, I've lost my place here. And in Ephesians 2, uh, 13 and 14, it says, But now in Christ, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. There's to be no dividing wall in the house of God. Amen. But we're to be united. I just want to share that, you know, uh, uh, this friend who was a, a spiritual mother to me and asked, you know, why there was no power in the church. She also came to me one day. She wasn't afraid of speaking her mind. And she said, you know what, Brenda? She said, you're prejudiced. I said, no, I'm not. How can, I'm not prejudiced. I love everybody. You know, we always say, I love everybody. Like the Bible tells us we should. And I didn't receive it. But one day, I, God is just so good how he leads us on our journeys and he knows what we need. And if we're humble and we yield to him, he'll, he'll get us to where we're supposed to be. Amen. One day I went to this church in, in Augusta and there was this beautiful older um, woman. She was in her 90s, um, Caucasian woman. And she had been with the, working in the vineyard for a long time. She called herself a handmaiden of the Lord. And she was wheelchair bound, sitting in the wheelchair. And she was preaching. I don't remember what her subject was, but I do remember her saying this. She said, beloved, she said, God is so grieved with the racism in the church. He wants his people to be one, to truly be brothers and sisters, not in mouth, but in, indeed in their hearts. Really love and look at each other and just see another person and not see a, a color. 
And so when she said that, the Holy Spirit just came all over me and he convicted me and he started showing me. It's as, it's as if a, a video was flashing before my eyes and he was bringing up thoughts and he was bringing up the thing about the books because I didn't even think about all the books I had read and the indoctrination I had and letting me know how I was indeed prejudiced and how I did look at a certain group of people a certain way. And when he did that, I just repented. I fell on my knees right there. And the Lord just delivered me and just healed me and just freed me. And the Holy Spirit just filled me in a, in a way that I hadn't known until then. And not only that, my back was hurting me. And he took away all the back pain at the same time. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. When we allow God to heal our emotions and our souls, he'll heal, also heal whatever's physically wrong with us. Amen. So God, so it's time, it's time, it's time, it's time for us to come together in love, come together in unity, look at each other as Christ looks at us. Ask God when we meet somebody, Lord, who is she? Lord, who is he? And relate to them the way Jesus relates to each other. It's time for us to come up higher, church, and to walk and function as Christ did. Amen? It's time for us to come out of the shadows and to no longer be hidden, but to let our light shine bright and manifest as the sons and the daughters of our great God. And when we do this, we're going to see how we're going to, God's going to use us to be part of this great, this great harvest that he wants to do that's going to come out. He wants to use us to, to win souls to Christ in a way that has never been heard of before. He wants to use us to heal each other and to heal other people and just to love each other, just to let people know that God loves them. So many people don't even know that God loves them. As the worship team comes back and takes their position, I just want to say that there are many, there were many hidden figures in the Bible. Joseph, Moses, David, Esther, and Mary, just to name a few. But the greatest hidden figure of all was Jesus Christ. The words of an old Negro spiritual come to mind, and it goes something like this. Sweet little Jesus boy, born in a manger. Sweet little holy child, we didn't know who you were. Didn't know you'd come to save us all, to take our sins away. Our eyes were blind, we could not see. We didn't know who you were. Do you know who he is today? Christ's own people didn't know who he was. They rejected him as the Messiah. John 1, 10 through 12 says, He was in the world, and the world was made through him. And the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, and to those who believe in his name. Matthew 13, 54 through 58 says, when he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers, James, Josie, Simon, and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? So they were offended at him. Instead of receiving what Jesus had to offer, they were offended at him. And can I tell you that even when you walk in love and try to share the love of God with other people, they may become offended at, at you. But that's okay. Because Jesus went around offending people all the time. Amen? Because he realized that it was more important. Their, their soul was at stake. So we can't worry about being fearful or offending. We've got to know that it's a matter of people going to heaven or hell when they leave here. And we've got to let go of that fear. Even when you're afraid, while you're afraid, share the love of God. That's right. Share salvation and let lead them to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. God is so grieved because so many people are going to hell every day. So it's a matter of life and death. There's an old saying that says, familiarity breeds contempt. Jesus' community thought they knew who Jesus was. Oh, that's just Mary's boy. Isn't he Joseph the carpenter's son? But they didn't know that his true father was God above, creator of all. Amen. Jesus was the word of God sent to earth to reveal God's love for the world. Yes, he was. Let me ask you a question, beloved. Do you know who Jesus is? Is he your savior? Is he your Lord? Come on. 
Let me ask you another question. Have you committed your life to him? And who are you? Are you a hidden figure? What is your purpose? Why were you sent to the planet? What problem are you here to solve? I just want to make several appeals today, and I pray that you won't let the spirit of fear or embarrassment stop you, but I pray that everybody comes to the altar that needs to come. First of all, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, I ask that you would come, because finding out who you are and your purpose for being will not begin until you commit your life to Jesus Christ. It all starts with him. And if you've never committed your life to Jesus and don't know him as your savior, please come forward today. Or if you've backslidden and walked away from him, he's a God of a thousand chances. So please come and recommit your life to him today. Second, if you've committed your life to Christ as savior and Lord, but you don't know who you are, you're not sure of your purpose, I invite you to come forward now and to ask Holy Spirit to show you what it is he has for you to do because he has something for each and every one of us to do. There is no least and no little. Everybody in the bottom of Christ, body of Christ, has an assignment and a calling and a gift and a talent that you're uniquely able to do for the Lord. And finally, if you know you've struggled with prejudice or racism, if you know that you've judged a whole body of people and not just took, taking them you know, just for who they are, but you maybe judge them by their skin color, their education, or, or if they're not part of your denomination, or whatever it is, I invite you to come today and ask Holy Spirit to reveal, reveal it to you, but also to touch your heart, to change you, and to take out all of these um, lies and false way of thinking and, and, and mindsets that we've grown up with and accepted as normal. Ask Him to just transform you, to change you, and to fill you with His love and to help you to see people as he sees people. Because God loves you. He loves everyone. And that's why the Bible says if we really wanna do the work of God, we need to love God and love people. Amen?